So, this is a talk about updating a live game, which we'll discuss in a few more details in a moment, and production for Path of Exile. I am Carl Devissa from Guiding Gear Games. This is a game studio, which is in Titorangi, Auckland. I started there about two years ago, um, moving up from Wellington. Um, I'd met Chris, the CEO, a while ago, and he said, we've gone into closed beta and we're very busy, and I said, I should come up and help you, and he said, yes. And so, two days later, I quit my job, and uh, my family and I moved up, and I've been there the last two years, and it's all good fun. Uh -huh. I am a game designer. This is the slide I put on every talk I do, and it's for me. You don't need to worry about this, but it's important to me. I am a game designer. I pretty much wanted to be a game designer since I was very, very young and started making games when I was 10. I went to university here in Christchurch University of Canterbury. And the best education I had was at the role-playing game club there, and I should have spent much more of my time role-playing and much less of it worrying about classes, but not that I worried about them too much. I'm also a producer at Path of Exile, of Path of Exile at Grinding Gear Games. Um, more recently, I've been doing much more of a production role, um, which I found quite challenging at first, until I worked out that I couldn't do game design and production on the same days, basically. Very different tasks. Game design is very systems thinking, it fills up your whole brain and you do it all day. Uh, production is mostly about interrupting people and being interrupted and it took me a long time to learn that when someone came to me with a problem, I came up with an answer and they argued at me and then they came away doing the exact opposite of what I said. I had done something valuable and they wouldn't have got to that place if they hadn't come and talked to me in the first place and that was a difficult lesson. So, Grinding Gear Games. We were founded in 2006 by three people, Chris Wilson, Jonathan Rogers, and Eric Olofsson. Uh, Chris and Jonathan were in Auckland and decided they wanted to make an action RPG. And they decided they were going to make the first free-to-play Western game. They'd seen the Asian free games. However, they'd never made a game before, so it took them a while to get it out. Um, and by then, free-to-play games had taken over somewhat on the Western world as well. Uh, now we've got 33 developers, which includes artists and programmers and game designers and an audio engineer and some people who sort of fit either in both the programming and artist camp or neither. And we've got 10 support staff, which we've had since we went into open beta and suddenly having 24-7 support became very, very important. We only make Path of Exile. We don't make any other games, we don't do any contract work, we do nothing but make Path of Exile, which turns out to be a very good thing. Um, lots of other game companies in New Zealand often make a lot of money on the side by contracting or working on other people's IP or some other stuff. Um, I don't know how they do that, but they must be very, very good to be able to do that because we find that making one game takes up all of our time and then some. Path of Exile is an online action RPG set in the dark fantasy world of Rayclast. So it's a PC game played online. If someone tells you PC is dying, I don't know what it'll do in the future, but at the moment it's not dead. Um, mostly because PCs are getting cheaper than cell phones in many places in the world, because cell phones are getting very fancy and PCs are getting quite, even more commoditized and cheaper to make. Uh, and college students can still only work on things with keyboards for the time being, that'll probably change, but in the meantime, that seems to be a, a true thing. Um, it's online only, so you can only play it online in our service. Part of this is it's been free to play. Um, we want you to come go play on us as a service, not buy it in a box. Um, we have what we call ethical microtransactions, which means you can give us money to make your character look pretty, um, and we play, pay no sort of buying power in the game. Um, people sometimes doubt we can make money like this, but we can, it seems to work well. Um, and the biggest thing people buy in online games is really status, and one way to do that is through supporter packs and cosmetic items and stuff. Um, so we just sort of miss out on the, the power items. Dark Fantasy World of Rayclast. It's uh, Grinding Gear Games IP. This is important. It's our own IP, it doesn't belong to anywhere else in the world. It's all ours. Um, to give you a better idea of the gameplay, I'm going to show the trailer. This is the beta trailer we've had since January. Why the a trailer from January? Because you're one week too early with your conference. <laughs> um, 
All the footage is from in the game, although we play around with the camera angle and a few settings, mostly because we're super cheap and like to do things very cheaply. We don't have sort of budget for doing fancy cinematics. Of all the human refuse that I exiled from Orieth, it is you that stands before me. I am touched by your devotion, exile. You have suffered adversity, agony, anguish to share this moment with me. skill tree that you may have heard mentioned before. So, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the game from now, but one thing I will mention when they showed the randomised levels and stuff is that all the areas in the game are instanced, which is actually important to the talk. Um, so it's not like an MMO where the world's sort of held open all the time and people sort of join it, um, but each time you sort of go into an area, um, the area is created for you and your party members, or if it's a town instance, up to 32 people, and there's some sort of flow control about who enters and who leaves the town, um, which is actually an important part of the game, technically, and it also makes it sort of an action RPG rather than an MMO. So after, since 2006, there was a lot of making the game. In August 2011, it went into closed beta, where we let people in with um, sort of access keys, and we also had a couple, three open weekends. After the second one, we had a reasonable amount of demand from people that um, they should be able to buy access to the game, um, which was, you know, seemed pretty good to us. Um, and, you know, many comments about throwing money at the screen and that sort of thing. So we started selling supporter packs, uh, which we sold for $10 for the sort of the cheapest one, which just gave you a beta access key, and we had a bunch of other packs pretty much modelled on Kickstarter, which was around at the time, but we didn't use Kickstarter, it was through our own site, um, up to $1,000 packs. Um, so through that process, we made about $2.5 million in crowdfunded support, which was very handy um, for getting the game made and expanding the staff somewhat. In January 2013, we went into open beta, so from that, from January, you can go onto the site, you can download the game and play it. So it's kind of released in all but name, um, given that you can just go and play it, and we're still collecting money and selling you microtransactions. Um, we also started selling open beta packs during this period, um, so 
smaller amounts of money, you can buy points, which get you the cosmetics in the game. Um, but you've actually got packs that go up to $12,500 now. Um, and the $1,500 supporter pack, um, I think we've sold the $1,000 packs, the diamond ones we had in closed beta, and the open ones, I think it's about 300 or so that we've sold in total. And of the $1,500 packs which sold in the first few weeks, 40% of them had bought a $1,000 pack previously in closed beta, which was an interesting thing. Uh, at our peak, we've had 70,000 concurrent users, and we still have pretty good daily numbers. Our average player plays for four hours in their play session. This is a bit unusual for games, even for PC games. Um, so when people play our game, they play it for a long time in a session. Um, Games in general are tending towards shorter play sessions, ours is not. Um, the, the demographic is pretty much, and if you were at the talk at the very beginning of today, that Lost Boy segment they were talking, pretty much all of our players are those people. Um, if you lo look at our users, they, it's not universal, but they fall fairly heavily into sort of a similar demographic. We are profitable, although most of the money gets spent on those 33 developers and 10 support people, so it's most of the money gets funneled into making the game um, bigger and better, which we're doing on an ongoing basis and will continue to do past release because you don't really... Back in the day in websites in the 90s, they used to have under construction signs on them. All these labels like beta and... I'm not really meant to say this, open beta and all that sort of things, they're those under construction signs and one day they'll go away and we'll just have games and you'll be able to go play them and they'll be in different stages of development. Infrastructure. We've got a bunch of servers. In fact, very early on, in well before I started, they had servers with software in Texas. So most of the development was built even before we had players for these Texas servers so they could go play it and test it with a, with a laggy 200 ping environment. Um, we've got servers in Texas, Netherlands, and Singapore. I can't tell you how many, I don't actually know. Um, and one of the advantages is it doesn't really matter to, our, to us too much. Uh, we can add servers very quickly and take them away. Most of the servers are ones that run the instances. Um, we do need a bit of lead time to get one up because um, you need to go talk to SoftLayer and say, can I have a server, and then you need to throw your stuff on it. So we like to have you know at least eight hours before we add servers to it. Um, and there's a bit of lead time to remove them and someone handles that and it all happens as if by magic. Um, SoftLayer also gives you free communication between Texas, the Texas data center and their Netherlands one and their Singapore one, which is really handy for us. And we've got some servers in Australia, which aren't with SoftLayer. And they mean people in Australia can play with lower ping um, but there are a few disadvantages because they're not sort of tied to all the other ones. We have a separate CDN for providing patches, um, which is like the large downloads that people get. Infrastructure, Linux servers, PC client we've already discussed, almost all C++. Um, there is some C Sharp in there. Our balance tools that we use is written in C Sharp because as far as doing accounting-like stuff, which turns into an XML file, which we then convert to a binary file, C Sharp's good at that stuff. Um, and the person who wrote it did it in C Sharp, and the C++, players, C++ coders look at it and go, I'm not sure what to do about that. Um, so most of the work I do is in our balance tool, and it's got C Sharp scripting behind it um, and generates those files. Website integration. So we consider our web page part of the game because all the objects integrate with it. You can see your character and your inventory, and that's all written in Python. Database stuff, we use Berkeley DB and Postgres for the website. Oh, gosh, my time's going fast. So I've going to my well. uh, we use continuous integration. We have um, what's called BuildBot, which actually a lot of companies use. All the work gets committed to it early and often by everyone. So if you're working, you'll be expected to commit several times a day. The work's committed to trunk, and it's built in. We've got a build popping out every 15 minutes or so. Um, takes longer than 15 minutes to build, but sort of the end process runs in parallel, and then you've got the stuff coming out the end. Um, source, all the source code, all the website, game stuff, stuff which is used for our tools, all is in source and is all built. Um, new build, as I said, kicks off 15 minutes. The art is all converted and put in. 
Source is easy, by the way, from a production standpoint. It's just text. It does crazy stuff when you compile it, but before you compile it, it's really easy to deal with. If something goes wrong, you can just look at it and get your programmer to just write it correctly or merge it or whatever. Art, before you do anything with it, is hard. Because um, it comes in all sorts of formats and they need to be converted. And the things that can go wrong and feel really non-deterministic when they're in a build process are many. Uh, bin is all the stuff which we can't which we need on the client, in the client or on a server or in our local servers that can't be um, sort of put in through the source or art process. So all our graphics converters and various files we want straight in our build need to be committed to bin. Balance, which is the stuff from the game design kind of stuff I care about, it's basically a bunch of stuff in XML gets converted to binary for use in the game. We'd like to do a lot of our maths outside of the game engine because as a game designer, I love power curves. They fix problems like anything. Our programmers have a rule, pass no floats. Because when you're doing an online game, if you want to fuck things up, you pass floats between the client and the server. And they're not, they don't like doing that at all. So anything which is like a power relation or I want to do, you know, fix a problem by applying to a curve to it, we like to pre-calculate all those values if we can. So we've got various things calculated and they all go in nice tables and all the spells and the monsters and the character data is all sits there and it also lets game designers mess with it without having to be programmers although any coding helps is one thing I've learnt if you're going to work in a games company any coding you can learn helps you'll never be good enough to be a coder necessary but it will all be useful asset tests we then test the crap out of it in the build process then we package it um, then we build the website, and then we deploy it. And the local system, that's fairly straightforward. Now, because we go through this process, and everyone's committing all their work all the time, has a very important thing that happens, is the build breaks. And this is really useful, because when you do work and you break the build, you get a lot of shit for it, and we can tell the nature of your character very quickly by how you respond to being breaking the build, but it basically means everything's tested very quickly. Um, all your work, has to work in the game, or it just the whole process breaks down, people stop testing, people can't see what happens with their work. But it does mean that any given moment, people are doing good work and throwing it in the game. That's locally. We also have to get the stuff out and working. And because people are putting work in all the time, it's not always useful to have any given moment that we would put into a live realm. So to get things out somewhere, we put them in another environment and we take a tag of where we're at with ASVN and say, right, this is what we're going to release, keeps everyone work up to now. We merge stuff out that's not meant to be there um, and we merge extra stuff in to make it work and QA tests it a lot. Technically we should use branches instead of tags and if you use SVN you go, what's he talking about using a tag for doing this? Um, they do kind of behave the same but you get more warnings when you use a tag and no one's actually gotten around to fixing our scripts so we do it properly. So um, if, you, if you know your SVN, that's why it says that. We have three environments locally, aside from the testing branch environment. Staging one, two, and three. So staging one is what's the same as on production. And if we have an emergency patch, we want something on the realm right away, we do merges directly to what's on staging one, test it, QA it, and deploy it as fast as we can. Staging two is the next formal patch, the next one we're working on and wanting to stick on the realm. And staging three is the one after that. Most of the time we're not worrying about staging three because we're trying to manage two patches long term. It gets really, really quite difficult and quite confusing. Um, but sometimes there's work with long lead times and we just, you know, we want some stuff sooner because we want to keep our players entertained and changing the game is really good for getting people interested in the game. Uh, we also have an alpha realm where we throw it out to a smaller group of players who do some testing there. And then we have production, or what we call the beta realm, where people actually play the game. Now I mentioned it's really useful to give them change. This is true. They get bored and they leave if we stop changing stuff. The other problem is, is they leave if we give them patches. <laughs> so it's very important to us that patches are very, very quick. I'm basically out of time, aren't I? Give me a couple more minutes. A couple more minutes. So, 
we normally have people join and leave and it looks like this nice curve and we deploy a patch and the numbers go like this because we have friction, basically people having it hard to update. Um, so when we do a patch, we preload everything up to the production servers and then when we want to deploy the patch, we give everyone a nice warning and then we swap around which everyone's kicked off, we swap around in which instances load, which set of software they come on, I'm not an expert on this because I don't actually have to worry about this bit, and people are then playing in again in about a minute depending on how big the patch is. Large patch does mean it takes them a lot longer to get back on, but it does mean our downtime is only a minute. And this is very unusual for gamers. They are used to very long patches from most of their games companies and regular maintenance. This is far too long for us. Because if you look at our numbers, one minute can be a long time. And if we've got database stuff to do, um, it can be longer than a minute because we've got to migrate database stuff. Um, so we're working very hard to get rid of this one minute downtime in patches. There's a few complications that may make it a bit more difficult in the future, um, but basically the plan is that when you're playing in an instance, you continue to play after we've deployed the patch and we'll have all the instances held open by the old stuff and when you close the instance or leave the instance and you can't stay in them forever because you run out of monsters to kill and treasure to pick up, then any new instances will be with the new software. As I mentioned, changes create interest, but also generate friction. I was going to talk about how people react to them. They don't like it when you nerf their build, I assure you of this. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in more, I'll, there'll be questions. I will say you can't ask me what's happening in the future at the moment because this is the one week I'm allowed to say the least possible. Um, our three founders are off in the US and the West Coast on a media tour and they're talking about all the stuff that's coming up and as a consequence of that no one else is allowed to and even the people they're talking to aren't allowed to for a couple of days but if you keep an eye on the gaming news you might see some stuff. Uh, you can contact me carl at grindinggear.com or carl.devissa at gmail.com until I read an article about Cerebral Fix talking about how they had uh, pressure from Auckland for jobs, there was also jobs at grindinggear.com there. <laughs> so if you're a really good C++ programmer who writes extremely safe code, we're probably interested in you, and if you're an artist, um, we're interested in portfolios from people. But, um, and my Twitter address is at carldev, and I hardly say anything on there because we're making a game. Two questions, we ran a bit over time there, and so did uh, Stephen Joyce down there. In the corner, go. <laughs> Okay, so our, our big countries are basically Europe and the US. There are far, by far our biggest markets. Um, we also have quite sizable amounts of players in Russia, uh, Brazil, it's a particularly big gaming country, but um, all over the world. Uh, we have a lot of Taiwanese players, um, which we were told we wouldn't get any Chinese players because our art style is all wrong, and apparently it's fine. Um, so we have a lot of Chinese and Malaysian players as well. But definitely Europe and the US are the really big, big markets for it. One more question. You got it. Uh, we don't patch the client in real time. That, unfortunately, is always going to take time for the client to patch. Um, but if we eliminate the minute, they'll be able to play on the old client um, until they're forced to reload by going into a new instance. And because it's a PC game and it's client heavy, we can't get rid of that bit, at least not for a, probably a very long time until stuff gets fancier. So, and we do try and minimise our patches, and we're not very good at it because it tends to... You know, there's a lot of art in the game, so they're often quite sizable patches. But anything server-side, we want to get rid of as much as we can. <laughs>